you. All right, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone to the uh, Menlo Park Fire Protection District uh, Board of uh, Directors uh, meeting for uh, uh, August 17th, uh, 2021. Uh, Michelle, would you call the roll, please? Director Bernstein? Present. Director Jones? Here. Thank you. Director Crawley? Present. Director Solano? Here. Director McLaughlin? Here. Uh, please join me in the pledge for the flag. I pledge allegiance yes. to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America. Of America. And, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, Stephen, I have to ask, I, I see on our agenda we have uh, reportable actions from the closed uh, session. Have I already satisfied that requirement? Yes, I think maybe just let's just let the public know that because there was a special meeting called for earlier this evening, the closed session items that are on this regular meeting agenda actually can be pulled because they were satisfied in the special meeting. All right, I think you just did. So thank you. Uh, Michelle, is there any public comment? One second to pull up my participant screen. <clears throat> Anybody has public comment? You could raise your hand or hit star nine. Seeing none, no, we do not. All right, thank you. Uh, our uh, first order of business tonight is a report of the fire chief for discussion and direction. Uh, chief uh, Shaver. President McLaughlin and uh, board of directors, good evening. Um, as you can see on the agenda item number one, a few things for the chief's report. Um, effective August 2nd, we moved the battalion one quarters from station one to uh, station six. Uh, this is going to provide better battalion coverage uh, for our district. And this is based on us having the second battalion chief uh, on the east side of town. So they were a little too close uh, with battalion one and battalion 101. So moving it to six spreads out the coverage for the district. Uh, National Light Out uh, just happened uh, there last week. We received a nice letter from the Appleton Town Manager, George Rodericks, uh, in response to our participation. And uh, that was through fire prevention and uh, engine companies. So thank you to those personnel who went out and represented Menlo Park Fire. Uh, the Emergency Preparedness Committee uh, had requested some information on our emergency water supplies within the district. And as you can see, stations one through 77, the different gallonage that we have of drinking water, uh, and that's uh, built in and uh, refilled regularly. And then it's pumped uh, into the kitchen and some other areas where that drinking water can be, uh, can be used. And then an update on our deployment. There's actually an addition to what's written here. Uh, all of our firefighters have been on the Dixie fire as far as uh, deployment location. Um, currently we have a, a strike team with uh, four members and it's a single engine on the uh, Dixie fire that's already been rotated once. We have the second crew up there now and the second crew is about to be rotated again. Uh, we also have a strike team leader uh, who is out, and he is not necessarily with our group, he's with another group, but they needed a strike team leader. And then we also have a strike team leader trainee uh, that is going to be going out, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, that is one of our uh, new battalion chiefs that just got promoted, and he already has the classes necessary for him to become a trainee and open a task book. So now he's going to go out and get some experience as a strike team leader and start to get his task book signed off. And that would be my fire chief support for this evening. Does anybody have any questions? Questions of Chief Schaefer, uh, Chuck? You're on mute, Director. Yes, thank you. Um, would you, uh, can you give us some idea on, of, of the, how, what's happening at the Dixie fire? Um, 
I don't have uh, a lot of intel on what's going on at the Dixie Fire. Um, I, uh, I do look up the Cal Fire map and I can see that it's almost engulfed uh, all the way around uh, Lake Almanor. And it's looking like it's heading mainly north, but a little bit easterly as well. <clears throat> I believe currently it's the second largest uh, single fire in the history of the state. Um, and I believe it's getting close to 600,000 acres. So not as, uh, still quite a few houses. I think it's in the hundreds and not the thousands, which is, which is good. But of course the hundreds isn't good either. But um, if you compare it to Oakland Hills, Oakland Hills lost 3000 structures. They're nowhere near that, but uh, obviously there are homes that are being lost, which is really unfortunate. It's just not as uh, populated as some other areas. And I had a question on the drink, on the um, emergency water supplies. Um, do I assume that th th this is emergency water for potable purposes? This isn't for pumping purposes, is that right? No, this is 100% drinking water. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Does that mean we have no, um, we have no reserve water uh, for, for pumping? Uh, no, um, we don't store water for that. However, uh, we do have drafting capabilities on all of our fire engines. So we can go to any static water, water source and fill up our engines um, through a draft. So we can go to a swimming pool or uh, some other large body of water and we can get water from that location. We would never use salt water though, is that correct? I hate to say we would never. Um, I know that they used salt water in Loma Prieta in 1989 up in San Francisco because that was their body of water they had to draw from. Um, I don't think it would be very good for our pumps. However, um, if push came to shove and that was all we had, there's always that possibility. Thank you. You're welcome. First question along those lines, if I may. Um, Chief, um, would it be, in your opinion, do you think that there, we should have extra storage capacity of pumping water somewhere? Um, I don't necessarily think that's uh, necessary because uh, we have the ability to take water out of numerous swimming pools or any other bodies of water. Um, I think that the, the water that we would we'd be able to use, we'd be able to find a place to get it. And if we couldn't get close enough to draft, we have float pumps and we could take a float pump, put it in a pool and pump it uh, into the uh, tank of a fire apparatus. So there's, there's many ways for us to fill our apparatus. Chief, do you mind if I add a couple items to that? Absolutely, John, thank you. So the city of Menlo Park, their water department has made an emergency well that is at their corp yard that has backup uh, power supply. So we have access to a hydrant there for emergency water that they have provided. The city of East Palo Alto has the Gloria Way well, which also has the same uh, capabilities that we can pull emergency water from there if needed. We also have uh, storage tanks at uh, Ikea as a possibility, though that is for firefighting purposes at Ikea. But again, if we need to access, we have that water supply. Then we also have uh, Bear Gulch Reservoir, which uh, is a very large static water supply that we also have access to hydrants for that. So, um, and then our two smaller water purveyors that we have also have storage tanks uh, on their sites that would be available if we needed for firefighting purposes, but those would also be for drinking water. So those water purveyors are required uh, to be able to have uh, some capabilities in regards to that. We are not the enforcer of that, but we do know that uh, there is access to water through each of those water purveyors. Thank you. And there you have it straight from the fire marshal. Thank you, John. <laughs> I wanted to follow up with the marshal on that. <clears throat> Do we, does the fire district have the right to use that water or, or only if somebody gives it to us? Uh, we do have the right in exigent circumstances. And that is why we work together uh, in regards to that. So I worked with the city of Menlo Park and East Palo Alto to make sure the hydrants that access those, you know, meet our specifications. 
Thank you. One follow up, I hate to drag this on. So do, is there a written agreement we have or is that this is in some type of code somewhere that, that expressly uh, convey that message to governmental entities that we have the right? Uh, I am not aware of an MOU. I believe that it is something that, uh, that we have the rights to, but that's actually a good question. I'll have to look into see uh, what gives the authority for us to utilize that in exigent circumstances. I, I would like to know, nobody else, that. I would like to know. Thank you. All right, any other um, questions for Chief Schaefer? All right, uh, our next item is um, a presentation regarding the, uh, uh, the, the unmanned aerial systems program. So Chief Schaefer, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Chief Johnson, the fire marshal, uh, put together a nice presentation. He is the, the person in charge of our UAS system. So uh, Chief Johnson, take it away. Thank you. Uh, directors, it was requested uh, two board meetings ago that there was a quick presentation given in regards to the UAS program in terms of its current capabilities and where it is going. Uh, so I'm going to throw a presentation up quickly. So this is our uh, unmanned aerial systems program update. I also have Chris Denenbaum on the line. If there's questions I am unable to answer to be able to give uh, some updates. So the capabilities of our current uh, unmanned aerial systems operations. Uh, you can see here through visual pictures that we are able to give an aerial view of the scenes that we are called out to in uh, entirety and also be able to provide live stream video updates uh, that uh, are available to any incident command. We're able to offer a large area of view so that we can enhance the decisions that are being made and also be aware of any unknown hazards and be able to mitigate those. Uh, we also are able to utilize it for a quicker and larger view of missing persons uh, or search and rescue operations. Uh, we have at least one operation out in the bay monthly and so it has been able to allow us to find uh, missing kayakers, boaters, uh, et cetera, a lot quicker because we can do quicker searches uh, utilizing this program. And then we can give real-time information. And as we know, the more real-time information you can have on the scene helps with uh, um, giving good information and uh, responses. And it gives us good scene documentation and reconstruction. So our program is focused on operational readiness, mission safety, and being able to give, give great actionable data to the incident command. Uh, right now, our personnel, we have Battalion Chief Calvert is our program manager. Chris Denebaum, captain, is our prog program coordinator. Uh, many of you know Tom Owen, civilian. He is a program intern part-time with us. We are utilizing his expertise to maintain and manage our fleet and program and helping to uh, move us forward. Currently, we have 14 FAA Part 107 licensed pilots and, that have completed our own task books. And then we have three additionals here in July that we, uh, and two more in August. And then Fire Prevention has two certified pilots that we're utilizing for inspections. Uh, we're utilizing it for roof uh, solar inspections, which uh, aids for safety and documentation. The aircraft that we currently have, we have eight, what we call rapid deploy small aircraft uh, that we have on every station. They are locked up. And then if a pilot is on duty that day, they would access uh, that airframe and take that with them uh, on duty. We also have two medium duty aircraft that has visual thermal sensors and then one on each of the battalion chief vehicles. One Pierce photo kite that is a tethered aircraft. It's on battalion one. And so that is a push button and it stays in place and it can stay up for an unlimited amount of time uh, due to a tethered power capabilities. We also have two high resolution aircraft that we're utilizing for mapping. 
Those are in the uh, SAU van and also fire prevention. And then we have uh, a DGI M300. This is also on the SAU van. This has uh, longer flight times, uh, monstrous amounts of zoom capabilities, again, for large search and rescues, uh, high resolution thermal, laser finders, uh, spotlights, and also a speaker system if needed so that we can communicate to any victims that, that we may have and also can do payload delivery, such as uh, dropping a life vest, radio, or some food, water as needed. Uh, the SAU van, the Situational Awareness Unit, is uh, off, off, able to offer mission support and uh, mobile commands. Uh, the aviation supports is through five uh, aircraft on board, uh, allows us to be able to recharge and is self-contained. It has uh, computer monitor screens and uh, is able to provide us image processing that we can do right there on scene and gives us also connectivity through our own Wi-Fi and other uh, media bands. So our future goals is to do strategic mapping. Uh, this picture on the left is the uh, Sharon Heights area. We are gonna be mapping this area soon so that we can have some wildfire uh, pre-planning, look at structures and most importantly, looking at vegetation uh, health, density, fuel, and then also be looking at the ingress egress routes so that we can prioritize what we have coming in and the residents coming out. And then we are also looking to be able to assign the SAU van into San Mateo County dispatch. We are not there yet, but we need to look into the deployment model for it as it is uh, becoming more well known and being uh, requested throughout the county. We also are looking at uh, utilizing the aircraft for joint investigations with our local law enforcement or other fire departments for uh, whether it's fire scene reconstructions or other accident scene uh, reconstruction through 3D modeling. And then we are also uh, looking into investigate ground-based and other robotic solutions so that we can stay on top of the technology and other items within uh, that can enhance the mission of the district. That is uh, the end of my program. Any questions? I'll, I'll go first, Chief uh, Johnson. Um, a couple of years ago, I think we sent out a team to do mapping at a wildland fire, one of the major wildland fires. Is is that still part of the program? So I was uh, I led the teams for that. So we went to the camp fire, car fire, and uh, the tubs fires, and we did mapping with uh, other teams. That was part of mutual aid that was actually requested through uh, the sheriff's departments uh, for that. And uh, it was to be able to have enough team members to do the, the size and scale of the mapping. And it is something that would still be available if requested. Is it, uh, if you know, uh, a major fire like the, the, uh, the Dixie fire that's burning, uh, is that usually done by uh, larger aircraft, you know, that type of, digital mapping of the, the scene? It depends on uh, the request that's being made. So uh, a lot of times the, the mapping that's being done, if it's during wildfires, Cal Fire has a pretty extensive aircraft to be able to do current fire lines and thermal. If you're doing mapping like what we completed, which was to do damage assessments uh, to aid insurance companies and also the, the city or the counties with their declarations, um, then this uh, scale allowed a more detail in the specific area. So it really depends on the needs and the request in the, of, of the requester. Okay, thank you. Chuck, I think you had one. I have two actually. Um, I wanted to ask you about the uh, ability in the future to drop an AED unit, <clears throat> for example, out on the Dunbarton Bridge where traffic is not letting any emergency vehicles through. When will that be available? Uh, that's something I'll have to assign to the team. Uh, a lot of it's based on weight and distance on what the current platforms can do. And so I would, I'm not sure if uh, Chris Denenbaum uh, is on the line. Uh, if, if we're able to unmute him, he might be able to answer that question. Otherwise we'll have to do an assessment to determine that. So Chris Denenbaum is raising his hand. So Michelle, if we can have Chris Denenbaum. Uh, speak. Oh. 
So lag there. Hi, uh, Chris Denenbaum, captain here at Humble Park Fire. I think I know most of you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, so yeah, I can speak to that um, a little bit about um, the um, AED. It, the medical component of response is the one portion that we left out of the drone program. We've It's never really been part of our response model, something that we focused on. Uh, we potentially could deliver an AED with one of our drones. It's an older unit. It has the payload capacity of about 10 pounds. Um, we potentially could deliver an AED device, um, but we're not really configured for that at this time, and I'm not sure that it would be safe. Uh, we could look into uh, how we might be able to do that moving forward, um, if that's um, a focus, but it has not been a focus of the program in the past. And one, one item also, director, to consider is uh, right now our drone flights, we have to do what's called line of sight. We have to visually be able to see uh, the UAV in flight. And so depending on where it would be delivered, if it's out of sight, then it could be difficult right now for us with the FAA rules and our licenses to be able to accomplish that. Let me follow up then. Can line of sight be passed from one operator to another? Um, not from one operator to another, but uh, a visual observer um, can be um, utilized to, um, to maintain that legal authority, um, but it becomes um, cumbersome, those, those types of operations with multiple visual observers and communicating back with, a, um, with an operator. The, the reason I, I raise it just for the future, I mean, it seems like the critical time period for use of an AED is you know better than I do, but two or three minutes, maybe up to five minutes, which is substantially less than our normal response time. And um, particularly with traffic and you know vehicles not being able to get by and so forth, it just seems to me that that's something that um, could be an important uh, lifesaver for, for people who are stuck in traffic. Um, yeah. We, we had these discussions with uh, Matternet, who's a local um, drone developer in Redwood City. A couple of years ago when we were discussing our um, aerial drone port program um, that you know we're uh, considering for station four um, and unfortunately Matternet is focused specifically on the delivery of goods but we did go pretty deep dive on um, the discussion as far as whether um, AEDs and those types of medical devices were a focus for our program we decided at that point that it was not a focus of our program um, so I would you know if I would need some direction to kind of go back in and, and explore that further. And let me ask another question. Maybe you don't know that, no, but are the maps, or, or not the maps, but even the, um, just the visuals that Zone Haven uses, are they things that are stored in the system or are, do they make use of live feeds from say drones and things like that? Chief Johnson. So, yeah, so Zone Haven is an independent product. So um, what they are utilizing is similar to like a, a Google Maps product. Um, but we actually have our own pre pre-planned program. So we're planning oh, on so. utilizing our own images to be able to um, have current imaging uh, utilizing uh, our own software. Okay, thank you. Quick question if I may, uh, Chief Johnson. I noticed on your goals, you have um, uh, the first one in terms of mapping. Uh, uh, is, and you mentioned that there are, there are certain area based upon that, which you showed in your presentation. Is that, do you see your, the mapping, utilization of mapping in the more rural parts of our district? Yeah, currently. Yeah, currently we've only mapped like the, the homeless areas uh, that have been in Menlo Park and uh, the freeway cloverleafs where we were having those issues. Um, we are getting prepared to do that Sharon Heights area and we're going to notify all the residents in that area before we do any of that, just so that, you know, if there's any concerns, they can be aware. Granted, you know, there's plenty of companies out there that do high digital imaging of all of the area already. Uh, I've had com companies in contact with me that want to charge us like $10,000 to be able to get the same images um, just for that area where uh, we could go out and fly it ourselves are obviously a whole lot cheaper. And uh, so, but we are going to notify the residents that we will be flying over to get 
those images for our purposes of wildfire pre-planning. Do you find that there may, one last quick, do you find that there, is there any value for the more urban dense part of our uh, district to, to have any kind of mapping uh, of that same nature? I know Zone I, Haven kind of points to, to, you know, in case of a something happens, they point people in a certain direction, but, you know, a lot of times people don't be turning on their their, their computer their iPad, you know, I know sure. the young folks do, but some of us don't. I, I think that's one of the nice things about, uh, you know, looking at the technology and trying to figure out all the uses. So we are uh, able to utilize uh, current pictures. We've been taking uh, pictures of construction sites. And so that way we can uh, be aware of the construction sites as they change and let the crews be aware of, hey, here's the different access points and what may change. And then also when a building is now complete, we can have a current picture because we can't wait for Google Maps to get caught up. And so we can have current pictures that allow us of, uh, you know, new streets and, and these buildings that get complete for pre-planning. And again, we have a uh, uh, new software called First Do that we're building out all the pre-plans right now. It's not uh, operational yet uh, to the first on online crews, but we are getting close to that hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, one last little tiny piece by me. Do you see any connections to be able to, once you start this mapping in the different areas, to be able to um, share certain information with our community, certain groups in the different, different cities? Uh, and do you find that might be of some value to them in their, their preparation to try, to try to help mobilize people in a disaster? I think uh, sharing is always good. It's how you learn and uh, prepare. I, I don't see any issues with sharing as long as it's approved by the fire chief, uh, you know, depending on the mission and who's going to have it and have access. So that that is things. There is some private information, and we may have to make sure that it's edited. Um, Chris, I don't know if you have any uh, response with that, but, you know, we just have to be careful with what we share, like with any sure. data that we have. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to mention that like at, the, at some of the major wildfires that we were talking about where we uh, flew, that was actually part of um, the dissemination of information. They made those uh, maps that we made. Um, their GIS department posted those online. Um, it was actually a pretty cool way for folks that weren't allowed back into their, air, their you know, hey, what's the conditions at my house? They could click on a camera and actually see the real time situation at their home, like the extent of the damage there before they were allowed back in. So it allowed people to have some kind of peace of mind or, or you know, closure or whatever it was, but they were, they actually were able to see what that information was like. So um, that's, you know, potentially what we could do with some of our maps as well. Obviously, if the fire chief was um, allowed us to um, release that information, um, that could be a resource for the, the public. I just wanted to mention that we've done that in the past. All right. Thank you. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on, on the mapping. Could you help us understand what the mapping job is? I mean, how often does this need to be updated? Um, do you store it in a library or an archive somewhere? What, what exactly are you mapping? Uh, Chief, do you want me to take this one? Yeah, go for it. Okay, yeah, so uh, a great example of, um, you know, follow-up mapping would be like our homeless field across from Facebook. We've mapped that on a monthly, bi-monthly basis because there's so many changes out there. You know, based on the large fire that we had at one point, there was a road that was cut in that changed access for us. We've um, located biohazard hits and things like that that are hazards that are changing on a sometimes a daily basis. Uh, there was a large open trench out there. These are all issues that our first responders are, you know, our police and fire are both facing when we go out there. So that's important information for our folks. Um, so it really depends on what you're talking about as far as how often we might need to map them. You know, uh, Facebook with our large construction sites, we've envisioned, you know, flying those buildings on a regular basis, updating our imagery and our pre-plans in, in um, you know, our, our software that we can access from our rigs. 
um, that's all powerful information that we can utilize on, on calls. So it depends. Some things aren't changing much in our district, and maybe they're just flown once, and that's good enough. But if there's something that's going to be, you know, an ongoing, changing type of situation, then we might get prioritized and tasked with sending a crew back out to fly them again. And then, how would you actually use it? If if, if you're going on a call, would would the crew actually review it? Is that a normal procedure? Yeah, I think Chief Johnson's a better one to speak to this one. Uh, that kind of yeah, that's the that's the goal is through our pre-planning software is that uh, when a call comes up, uh, hopefully we'll be able to be tied into uh, public safety dispatch and it'll automatically come up on the iPads and the rigs, but also our battalion chiefs, depending on the call, if you're dealing with a, a longer term call, whether it's an active shooter or, you know, we have a, a wildfire that's, uh, you know, a brush fire that's burning uh, out there, then they can pull up those those maps and be able to understand the vegetation, the terrain. Um, there's a lot of information that we can get. And one of the things that I want to do is actually start mapping that vegetation that's over on our west side up in uh, the Sharon Heights. And if I can map it monthly, I can actually start looking at the moisture content, the fuel types, and uh, et cetera. And then we can start understanding if we're having uh, a large amount of growth in an area. Um, or if we got a wind heading in a certain direction, uh, just by looking at that map, we're going to be able to start telling how uh, fire may progress. So you want to have that stuff current on a monthly basis because who knows what changes. And do the drones carry sensors that give you that information, like, like water content or moisture content? So there are specific cameras that, that you can get. So um, I know that there's also different technology. I don't know if we have all of that yet, Chris. Are you able to answer that yet? No, there's, there's essentially, uh, we only have two types of cameras. Um, we have uh, a visual camera and we have a thermal camera, IR camera. Uh, we wouldn't be mapping it in IR generally for things like fuel moistures and um, health, those types of things. It's just a regular camera that we fly. It's the way that the information is displayed, which is, the third party app that we would use to fly it um, can actually give us a different way that that information can, is displayed and it can show things like how uh, the amount of moisture and things. Uh, we are looking at a, what's called a multi-spectral or NDVI um, camera that um, will actually be able to detect some different information than just visual. Um, so we would start out with the basic mapping and then it's just, like I said, it's just displayed in a different way, but um, it does display, uh, in a way it does display um, fuel moistures. Thank you. Yeah, no, Rob? Yeah, uh, thank you, John um, and, and Chris for your presentation. Uh, who, if you do like a, a assist with the, the sheriff's office or any law enforcement agency, who, who retains the uh, tape or the software or the uh, evidence, if you want to call it? So we make sure that we follow chain of custody properly. So if we're called out and it is uh, for law enforcement, we literally hand over the chip immediately right there on site. So that way chain of custody is immediately with the law enforcement. Um, otherwise, uh, we have our own uh, hard drive uh, server that we maintain with IT, and so everything is available as public records if needed, and we maintain uh, that data. Yeah. To, Jim, can I follow up on that? Yeah, sure, Rob. Yeah, uh, you know, under the chain of evidence, even though you turn that chip over, you know, you're still part of the chain of evidence because it came out of that particular device, and we own the device. Have we had any court challenges or anything relative to this yet? Not that I'm aware of, but uh, law enforcement seems to be quite comfortable with that procedure since the data was put onto that specific device and they actually have physical retention of it. Oh. So kind of, kind of similar to like a camera, even though the camera took the picture, the data is on that, that chip card. Uh, the court's not worried about the camera itself. They wouldn't want where the data's at. And this is the same way the, the UAV is just a, a camera with, with propellers or wings on it. And so the data is on that chip, which the law enforcement has 
has the possession of it. Yeah, well, well I don't want to get into a custody yeah. of evidence aspect, but any device that's used could be court challenged relative to how it was used, who used it, how it was presented. So uh, I think we've yeah, been lucky so far. You yeah, know what I mean? Do, yeah, we, so we are able to do flight logs and everything that can back that up for a okay. long time. All right, yeah. But then we retain all that stuff, so. Yes. So if there's, so we control all the uh, SA under storage area network for the whole thing. We have a specific one just for the UAV data. And do we use the state with us the five years or is it two years? Uh, typically, um, if it involves a building, it's for the life of the building. And um, really? Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's written in law for us. And so, and th so I'll hold on to it. Okay, all right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chris. All right, if there's uh, nothing else about uh, drones, we'll move on to the next item, which is a uh, description of our efforts uh, regarding uh, illegal fireworks this year. So Chief Schaefer, I'll, I'll hand that off to you. And once again, uh, that's gonna be handed back off to Chief Johnson. He, uh, he led the Fire Prevention Bureau in conjunction with our neighboring police agencies for the uh, Fireworks Task Force. So John Johnston, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you again. I just real quickly wanted to uh, emphasize the great collaborative efforts that we had with East Palo Alto Police Department, Menlo Park Police Department, and our own uh, Fire Prevention Bureau. This is not really a, a pat on our backs, but it's more recognition of the success that the team had. This is the first time that we actually worked in collaboration together. We know that the community uh, has a really difficult time and we've had a number of fires and injuries related to fireworks. This year with the task force, uh, they were able to perform a number, a number of operations that we believe actually had significant impact on what the community experienced. Could we stop it all? No, but I believe the data that we have will actually show that we actually made a significant impact in the community. Um, so what we used was public education, reaching out into the community uh, to uh, obviously stop fireworks and their use, uh, community collaboration, which again was between each of the agencies. Uh, we did a voluntary collection program so people could drop off anything that they had in their possessions voluntarily with no uh, criminal issues. And then we actually had enforcement, uh, which was done by uh, the PD. Here's a sample of a number of the advertisements that we had in, in local papers and also on all our social media. San Mateo County and City of Menlo Park made $1,000 fines for people that were caught with uh, the fireworks, but however, if you surrendered them, it was free. Uh, you'll see here a number of photos of M1000s and M2000s. Uh, those are the very large explosions that you hear. These are you know, equivalent to portions of sticks of dynamite. We were able to get these off the street. Um, this is one hall where we had two arrests, uh, 434 pounds of fireworks. Uh, this eliminated over 14,000 discharges. And another uh, hall, 471 pounds of fireworks, removed 5,000 discharges, another couple of arrests. Uh, another 460 pounds of fireworks and one arrest. And you'll see, uh, we also were able to obtain at least PD, firearms and cocaine on one, but just a lot of fireworks. And um, through all this, this was our total haul this year. We had over 3,600 pounds of fireworks, which had a $73,000 street value. It prevented 86,000 discharges that, you know, I know we heard a lot of fireworks, but we prevented 86,000 of them from occurring, you know, this, uh, this year. And uh, also 175 M1000s, 22 M2000s had a total of 32 arrests through these operations. So what was the impact? For East Palo Alto, their shot spotter, which keeps track of this, they had a 58% decline 
in the number of activations this year compared to last year. I think that's pretty significant that the community of East Palo Alto was made aware of uh, at their uh, city council meeting. But 58% is pretty significant. From, and that was moving from 25,000 uh, sounds heard to just a little over 10,000. And then the city of Menlo Park actually had a 44% decline in complaints. And complaining is, is obviously a way of measurement. They do not have shot spotter to be able to detect those numbers. But the fact that the community did not call as much uh, is an indicator. And for us, we only had five very small brush fires this year uh, that, uh, that I was able to track where last year we actually had a house fire, a carport fire, and so several other large brush fires. Uh, and so we actually had significant less dollar damage to our community. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you for the partnerships that we had and the co uh, collaboration with the city of Menlo Park and the city of East Palo Alto for uh, really a great success in actually helping our community this year. So I know it uh, is really difficult for a lot of people. You know, th thank you, Chief Johnson. I, I, I want to thank you and uh, you know, Chief Schaefer and, and you know, the people that were out there you know, doing the work and our partners from East Palo Alto, Menlo Park in this. I, I think you know, those results speak for themselves. And I just have one question for you. Uh, uh, I think you said 33 arrests. Are, are they being prosecuted? Were files, uh, charges filed? I have not followed up with PD on that. I'll have to uh, follow up to see what the status is. Okay. Thank you. And again, just great work. Thank you. Virginia? John, thanks, thanks so much for that report. If you could just uh, thank the two PDs, the, the depart police departments, that would be great. I, I think do. that a lot of the community, the members of the public who I've heard from um, think that it was a great program. Thank you. Excellent, glad to hear that. Uh, sorry, Robert, I think you were up next. Yeah, I wanna thank you, John, and, and please tell all your team members that uh, uh, I live in East Palo Alto and I, I know that we still heard a lot of the cannon is going off, but it was less cannon than it was years prior to. So, and and then to see the, the actual numbers that you provided to us as to the number of uh, hall, as I may always say, that you collected uh, and the rest, uh, I'm sure the residents are, are very appreciative of, of the work that not only the PD did, but also uh, the fire department uh, as as lend assistance to. So thank you and the team uh, awful lot. Uh, Chuck? Yeah, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. And, and by the way, I, I don't really think this is a primary mission of the fire district. I think it's a law enforcement um, problem primarily, but I, I think cooperating with that is, is, is a very positive thing. Um, but I just want to exercise a little bit of caution here insofar as, as the data and so forth. The people that I spoke to anecdotally felt that this was a worse year than last year. And the, the explosions were larger. They shook homes. There was a feeling that we were living in a war zone and uh, not just little firecrackers. And I, I don't even know fireworks is the right word for it. These were explosions that if you heard it, you thought that a factory nearby exploded and the whole house shook and, and so forth. So uh, please, whatever you can do, don't let up on, on, on the diligence in terms of, of stopping this. I had seen a press report perhaps two weeks ago, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it was, it was perhaps something that Jeff Liu made to the East Palo Alto City Council or something and reported in the Daily Post and from it, it, it suggested that there had been only one arrest in total. Your, your information suggests that there were a lot more arrests than that. Did you by any chance see that article? And um, that there I didn't see the article, but I worked hand in hand with Jeff Liu, and actually Jeff Liu made this presentation, and uh, so I trust his stats. Okay, so I'm glad there were a lot more arrests when I thought there was only one. I felt like they were 
letting people off and so forth. But I can tell you, even last Saturday night, as recently as Saturday night, between 9.15 and 9.30, we had major explosions for 15 minutes that just didn't stop. And previously on another weekend, I had called, I had called and I'd, I'd actually gone outside my house. I could see where the fireworks were going off. I said, right at the corner of Manhattan and Woodland and so forth. And the person, the, the woman on the, on the emergency thing says, well, you got to give me an exact address. I said, I'm not going to walk down there and look at the house to give you an exact address. You just go to the corner. Well, I have to have an exact address or I can't take a report. And I said, oh, forget it. And I hung up. So I'm a little concerned when I see that, that reports of, have gone down because I haven't called again. It just, it just isn't worth it given what happened. So again, there's another side of the story. I, I think we're going in the right direction. Congratulations. And I'm, all the seizures are great, but this job is not over yet. Nope, it, it will take some time. I believe uh, Director McLaughlin, I believe there was a, a, a hand raised from one of the other uh, people in the, in the room. Actually from a member of the public, Jim, I don't know if you're ready to take public comment yet. No, we, we can take it now. I don't- uh, I think Rob got his hand up. Oh, I didn't see Rob, uh, sorry. Rob, and then Michelle, if you could, uh, uh, you bring in the, uh, the citizen. We'll do. Rob? I just want to, yeah, you know, being, being uh, former law enforcement myself, John, I, I think just for your cooperation of the two local law enforcement agencies is stellar and, and uh, just thank you for your hard work there. Uh, I know it's, who who took possession of all those fireworks? Did the police uh, department do it or no? So that is that is why we have to uh, cooperate. So by law, we have to take them. Oh really? And uh, so we take those, and the state fire marshal is required by law to uh, pick those up. So literally within a week after July fourth, uh, we had a countywide pickup, and the state fire marshal takes those and disposes of them. So they're already gone and disposed of. Well, well, even a, a larger thank you then for taking yeah. possession of all this. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Hey, thank you. Uh, Michelle, do we have a public comment? Yes, they're I made a, able to speak now. Hi, Maida. <laughs> Hello, uh, everybody. Thank you, you know, for oh, yeah. the opportunity to speak on, on this particular issue. Yes, sir. I, I think I agree with everyone. I think it was wonderful that uh, multiple public agencies were able to get together, create a task force, and really target, uh, you know, the messaging and, and the response uh, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, you know, people certainly need to be applauded for that. However, uh, the figures do not reflect the, re the reality that I, as a resident, had to live through. I think this, I thought last year was the worst year. It wasn't. This was. The fireworks were considerably louder. My car alarm went off so many times and so many other car alarms this year than ever before. And so I know it's not the mission of, uh, of the fire district, you know, to, to handle the law enforcement aspects of it. But I still do think that the fire district has certain responsibilities that I think need to be exercised. One, I'd like to ask the question as to how the task force was constituted. When was it constituted? And why was uh, a public health not one of the members. There's some extent you deal with public health issues. And there are major public health concerns given the loudness of the explosions. So I, I sincerely think, and I'll share this with other public agencies as well, 
So that task force needs to be expanded. The other, the other entities that need to be included in it. You're concerned about fires. Who's concerned about, you know, the auditory health of the residents, you know, of the, of these communities that you serve. I think the health departments need to be involved in that task force. And this is not to take away from the work that has been done. It's amazing how much you gathered, how much you collected. And it's amazing how many people have been arrested. But I'll frankly tell you, the short spotter is statistics is totally meaningless to me. Because this was the worst year in terms of loudness. And I know law enforcement does absolutely not have the capability to be able to address the issues on those days that these explosions occur. And so we need to come up with a different strategy. And I, I agree with Chuck. I stopped calling law enforcement three years ago because it's totally meaningless. I've stood in front of an address where explosions were occurring and told dispatch, I'm right in front and this is the address. I'm going to wait for the officers. And they never came. And the people that are involved in this activity were just laughing at me. Law enforcement has, does not have the ability to deal with the issue. So we need to come up with other strategies. So I think, yes, let's, let's, let's keep the task force. Let's expand the task force. Let's get citizens involved in the task force and let's craft ways of prevention. You know, thank you, sir, for uh, sharing your thoughts on the subject with us. And uh, I'll ask Chief Johnson if you have any brief remarks. Yeah, Maida, I know you and I have known each other for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, please sir. reach out to me. And uh, yeah, I know definitely speaking with uh, Chief Liu, uh, we we're talking already about earlier efforts and what we can do next year to try to expand. So I would definitely love to uh, reach out with you and you know, have a cup of coffee and see what we can do to uh, expand within the city of East Palo Alto and Menlo Park. So thank love you. to hear your ideas. All right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Or there Chief Johnson? No other public comments. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right, well, thank you again, uh, Chief, for that, uh, that great presentation. Uh, that brings us to the consent calendar. We have uh, three items. Um, I'm sorry, Director McLaughlin, there's a item number four, which is up, update on fire station oh, four. Part, pardon me, you're, you're so correct. So uh, Chief Schaefer, I'll uh, hand that off to you, the update on the uh, fire station four construction. Thank you, Director. And uh, the, the person that runs our construction programs is John Hitchcock. And John Hitchcock, John Hitchcock has prepared a, uh, a quick presentation for you. Hello, directors. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go over the uh, current status, the projected schedule, and then the uh, financial status of the Fire Station 4 project. So if you've driven by Fire Station 4, um, you may have noticed that the electrical steel is now up. All the interior concrete on the first floor and the second floor is completed with the exception of the apparatus bay. Uh, we have two more pours in order to complete that, which will be completed by the end of this month. Um, we just started our interior uh, metal stud framing. So that's gonna continue as well as the rough-in for the uh, mechanical plumbing and electrical conduits. Uh, both the rough-in as well as the metal stud installation is expected to take about two months to complete. Once that com gets completed, uh, that'll take us into October and November. Well, well, where we'll be uh, installing the roofing, the interior drywall, and the uh, exterior facade. Then we jump into December and January, where we're going to be performing the uh, finish work. So we'll be doing like the casework, some equipment installations, the appliances, light fixtures, and the elevator. And we are expected to be doing move-in in February of 2022. Once we move in to the fire station, we will uh, proceed with phase two of the project, which is the demolition of the residential house, uh, the construction of the parking lot behind the fire station, 
as well as the emergency generator, the fuel tank, and the monopole. Um, in regards to the financial status of the project, the board approved a $15.5 million budget for the entire project, which included a, an approximately $11 million contract with the general contractor. To date, um, when we take into account our open contracts and our encumbrances, we still have approximately $1.5 million, uh, which can be used toward this project. And if it's not used, it can be carried forward to other projects. Um, however, there are still a few contracts that have not been approved by the board yet uh, for this project, which includes um, the alerting contract, which is on your consent, uh, consent calendar tonight, as well as the furniture contract and the monopole installation. That concludes my uh, oral report. You know, thank you, John. I, I walk by the uh, uh, site, you know, often, and uh, it's been uh, uh, great to watch it take shape. And, you know, now that the steel up is up, you can really get a, a sense of it. And you know, I want to thank you, uh, you know, for all the work you do. You know, I, I know that you're you know, intimately involved with every detail every day. And, and thank you so much for the, the wonderful work you do every day. You're welcome. Are there any uh, uh, questions? Uh, for uh, John? One, one question. I have a question. Robert? John, uh, uh, you mentioned about the budget in terms of where you are in terms of expenditure. So that's roughly what uh, you have plowed through about 60% of your budget so far, would you say? And uh, is part of that, some of that uh, contingency, you have adequate contingency funds remaining for that may come up? Sure, uh, let me uh, clarify and summarize uh, the financials a little bit better. So again, we had about a $15.5 million um, budget and most of that budget was awarded to the general contractor as well as a couple other contracts such as the architect's contract and, and the project manager. So we still have most of that money um, withheld because they have not earned, earned those fun, funds yet, but they have been encumbered. So of the amounts that we still have unencumbered is approximately 1.5 million. In regards to our contingencies, the, we had a district contingency of approximately 600,000, and we also had a change order contingency for the general contractor, which was 5% of their contract. In regards to how much we have approved in, have approved for change orders, we've approved $24,000 so far, and we have another 34,000 pending. Usually when you look at change order budgets, you compare it only to the general contractor's contract and not the entire uh, project budget. So as of right now, we're at 0.5% in change orders in comparison to the general contractor's contract. Um, so right now we're doing really well and as far as change orders are considered, uh, but there is definitely a long ways to go in order to complete this project. So how is the, the general contractor, are they pretty much on, as you can see, on target with their expenditures and, and, and timing of, uh, of the project? Well, in, re in regards to timing, we've been doing really well. Um, I think last time I uh, provided a report to Chief Schappelman at the time, uh, he reported that we were um, slightly ahead of schedule. We continue to encounter um, material shortages throughout this project. Uh, we had problems getting the metal decking. We had problems getting the metal studs. Now we're having problems getting the roof insulation. It's, it's all related to um, supply shortages, mainly because of COVID, uh, but also because of other reasons as well. And we were supposed to get the metal studs approximately two weeks prior to when we got them. So we did lose a little bit of time there. However, the installer has provided more manpower and is starting to make up some of that time. So we're, we're pretty much still on schedule though to do the move in in February and complete the project on time, though we did lose the, the time that we were ahead of schedule during, you know, that we provided to you in the prior update. Um, in regards to um, whether or not the contractor can stay on budget, you know, 
we don't really get into their finances too much. However, they have been uh, voicing concerns with the shortages, indicating that those shortages could become a, a district problem. Because if we don't find alternate solutions to move forward with, uh, it will definitely slow down the project. Are, are, you are they making reference to alternate solution in terms of uh, material um, or this alternate solution in terms of terms of what? It, it would be finding alternate sources for materials, whether it's different suppliers or specifying different products uh, that could be used instead of what we specified in our project documents. Anyone else? Again, John, thank you so much for all your work and you know, you, it's, uh, You're welcome. Uh, you know, great progress and, and uh, keep it up, uh, Virginia. Yeah, I just want to thank John too for all your work. John, just know that um, I've gotten some comments from friends who live on this west side and they're very happy about the uh, station and like oh my god it's so big compared to the old one <laughs> so just yeah, know that there's big. positive feedback coming to y'all all right appreciate it thank you thanks all right now we're at the uh, consent calendar so there's uh three items is there a a motion to uh to move them so moved is there a second Second. Second. I think Robert Jones uh, was the first second that I heard. So is there any discussion on these items? All right, Michelle, would you call the uh, roll? Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. All right, that brings us to um, our regular agenda. Uh, we just have one. Uh, item uh, an informational report on mandatory vaccination as requested by director bernstein so chief i'll uh, i'll throw that off to you thanks president mclaughlin members of the board uh, during a uh, committee meeting director bernstein had requested information uh, regarding uh, mandatory vaccinations and basically he wanted to hear some background on the subject um, what other agencies were in the process of doing. Um, we also added in some data on our current vaccination status and uh, some information on uh, history with COVID within the department. And uh, Melanie Stars, who's taking care of her, uh, her ill mother um, out of the country right now. She wrote this report, however, um, she's unable to make the meeting tonight. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to give uh, information for Director Bernstein, and I think uh, he was wanting to have a discussion of some sort. All right, thank you for that, Chief. Uh, Chuck, did you, uh, I know you distributed uh, your uh, uh, thoughts on this before uh, the meeting this evening. Did you want to uh, expand on them? Yes, I, 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 I will just do this briefly. I tried to outline my thoughts on this. I, I, I think we have a major obligation in terms of serving our uh, residents to require vaccination of uh, all the district personnel. I mean, we are, by virtue of the numbers of calls we um, go on, we are primarily a provider of, of medical, you know, emergency medical services. And I think to, to allow um, those people to be, you know, in the midst of our clients without <clears throat> that additional protection that vaccination can offer, I think just is irresponsible for us. And I think it subjects us to potential, significant potential liability um, we also have the, the, the problem of, of providing a safe workplace just in general. Um, we did have a complaint early on in the, um, in, in the uh, pandemic of, you know, that we were not maintaining a safe workplace. 
And um, uh, so this is something that already concern, you know, concerns at least some staff members. Um, my guess is it concerns more than perhaps are willing to speak up about it. Um, we also, because these, these the firefighters are housed in communal living situation um, and because, you know, the, the whole situation is in flux right now, but at one point we were, we were at a point where vaccinated people didn't need to wear masks and that could have been a firehouse. But if there's one person who's not vaccinated, those people could not wear, would have to wear masks all the time. And um, my guess is that they'd probably fudge the rules. They'd assume that the person was safe and that if anybody did get infected and, and something came of that, that we would have liability for not having maintained a safe workplace, which we're, we're required to do by OSHA and Cal OSHA. And uh, certainly the, the prospect of a, of a lawsuit to enforce this, I think is, is significant. I mean, we, we, we could be talking about uh, millions of dollars of liability. Um, so my proposal is that we require vaccinations and we do it in a responsible manner. I've outlined my recommendation here is that we begin the discussions with the um, with our unions and the unrepresented staff to talk about the proposal and see what their concerns might be. Um, I'd like to see it on the agenda of the Human Resources Committee. And uh, thirdly, I, I'd like uh, uh, District Council to suggest what kind of a um, uh, resolution we would need uh, and if there are any legal uh, problems in that. I noticed in um, Melanie's report, she mentions that uh, she is still uncertain whether requiring vaccination is legal. Um, that, that runs counter to everything I, I read in the, in the paper. Um, uh, I think uh, several courts have already ruled that it is legal to do that. Um, I know my, I mean, we, I'm a, I'm, provide education and childcare services, we've required our 100 people all to be vaccinated. And, um, and we offer no, no alternative to that. Obviously, if somebody had religious objections or if their health is such that they, they can't be, um, we, we find an alternative in those situations. But we've required it. It's something that our, our families appreciate. Um, it's going to be much more of an issue when we get to the point of children being vaccinated, whether we're going to require that or not. But I think actually probably legislators will take care of that for us. I think that I think that that vaccinations will be mandated. Just we already have mandated vaccinations for smallpox and diphtheria and you know all, all uh, measles, mumps, rubella, and so forth. I mean, it's it's just a normal thing that people protect themselves and others from this. So I, I think that, um, you know, we, we certainly should get a legal opinion on it where the pitfalls might be, but I think we need as a, to be a responsible agency. I think that we need to start moving in that direction and see where we go. So that's, that's my proposal. Um, I don't think there's any cost to doing this, but I think there is an enormous potential cost to not doing anything and uh, I don't want to be in that situation where we get sued by somebody who is either dies or is disabled, the family, the heirs of somebody who dies or is disabled because we didn't, we didn't move in an expeditious manner. So that's, that's what I'm proposing. So I, I, I have a question for Stephen. Uh, this is on our agenda as an informational report. Uh, are we limited in the action that we can take because it is labeled as an informational report? Thank you for the question. Um, despite it being labeled as an informational report, on the face of your agenda is the announcement that the board may take action on any item on the agenda, and this would be subject to that broad disclaimer. Um, and in addition, uh, I believe the action that Director Bernstein is calling for is to study and present this, bring this to the board at a future date, 
where the actual vote on a policy decision would be made. So I, if, if, if the will of the board is to move this forward, as Director Bernstein has indicated, that's fine the way the, the, this item has been agendized. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Rob? Yeah, uh, if, if Chuck uh, won't make a motion, I will that we forward this uh, to the Human Resource Committee for, for further study. And then secondly, uh, direct staff to monitor the uh, situation with our own San Mateo County Health Department. Uh, I, I know that the county has, uh, San Mateo County has not required their employees all to be tested, but all federal employees are required to be tested. So, uh, and I know some private industry that are requiring all employees to be tested. So I think this is something that we really need to watch. And secondly, Chuck brings up the aspect of, of you know, since we are a public safety agency, you know, we don't want to jeopardize any of our members of our community also. So thank you, Chuck, for uh, your staff report and so following up on it. Rob, could you just restate your, your motion? We'll see if we have a second. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, forward this to the HR committee for further action and uh, have our, uh, well, have the fire, um, our, our senior staff or fire district monitor the current events because they're changing every day to see if the county uh, will impose a countywide uh, vaccination program for their employees and that, you know, we should follow suit with all the other surrounding uh, jurisdictions. I, so, I, I, I would suggest that, you know, perhaps we break that into pieces and, and just the first one would be the referral to the HR committee. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah, just refer to the HR committee for further action and follow up. Okay, is there a second to Rob's motion? I, I'll second uh, the motion. Is there any, any further discussion? Robert has his hand up, Jim. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see that, Robert. No. Um, it's, it's mainly a clarification question. So, Chief, um, is it my assumption that uh, we don't have a anything in place right now currently to to mandate people or or do we have anything in place right now like to 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 suggest to people staff that vaccination is appropriate not appropriate or at their leisure do, do we have anything in place so director we do not have any type of mandate in place however um we absolutely offer vaccinations to anybody that choose to get vaccinated and uh, we've actually had um, one more person get vaccinated in the last I believe week and we have two more inquiring so our numbers are slowly increasing with those people being vaccinated. Do we have any do we have anything that suggests that they need to get tested every day before they come to office or anything like that? We do not. Uh, we have a flow chart based on exposure, based on vaccination status of exposure, and based on if someone has signs and symptoms. We refer all of those people to our infection control officer, which is Melanie, and we have two backups to her, and they are the ones that uh, advise as to whether they can come to work or can't come to work, how long uh, all of the uh, rules associated with uh, people being off for different COVID reasons. So are, is it mainly get targeted those, the 26 people who are not vaccinated or I assume that that information being targeted to those, those individuals? So the information regarding symptoms, et cetera, is for the entire department, not just those that are unvaccinated. There is uh, per County Health and the CDC, there's some different avenues you take based on vaccination status, but that's the only difference that we discern between uh, those that are vaccinated, unvaccinated is per the CDC and County Health. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Virginia, I think you had a question. Yeah, so quick question for Mike. Um, it looks like different places in California, including I mean, San Francisco and Alameda County mm -hmm. and Sacramento, the firefighters are pushing back on a mandate for um, vaccine or be, for them to be vaccinated. Um, so I just want to, I'm not against having the HR committee look at this, but I would like to understand the scope of that, um, Rob, since you made the motion, you know, how this would um, be embodied in our MOU with our firefighters. I mean, I, I don't know, because like, the last time we negotiated with them was before 2020. But it seems like the trend is that a lot of the um, firefighters are not in support of mandated vaccines for them. And so, I, and I don't know if that's the case here, Mike, but do we have any idea what percentage of our firefighters are vaccinated? Because I do, I do want to respect their concerns as well, but I, I just don't know what, where I can we tell are. you that the 2,400, 100% supports vaccinations. However, they are not at a point where they support the mandate. Um, however, because it's an evolving situation with FDA approval and numerous other items, um, I think they're watching it closely. And as far as uh, the data on vaccinations, uh, our line personnel, we have currently uh, 77 vaccinated and 19 non-vaccinated. That's pretty, that sounds pretty, one is significant, but that sounds pretty, I mean, these are the people that, the, the staff that go out, service the calls, God knows what's out there that they may encounter. Um, I, you know, it just seemed like that is, I mean, that should be a no brainer. And, and whether it's a religious issue that, they may have, or they just fall in line like, you know, almost 40% of, of America is in terms of having been vaccinated. So the question is at, at least testing, minimal testing on a daily basis, you know, I, I think it's, it is imperative uh, if they don't want to get, don't want to get um, vaccinated because, you know, that's just leaving them and their family exposed to the, the probability of getting exposed. I can tell you that there's one more statistic that's at the bottom of Melanie's page, and it shows that uh, we've had a total of three firefighters positive for COVID within our district. And right now? None of, no, this is over the period of the entire pandemic, and uh, none have been traced back to their employment. None of them traced back to the district. None of them were. None of them, we were not able to trace anyone who received who got COVID. We can never trace it back to being exposed within the district. Everybody and was very was, good about. I'm sorry. Sorry, Mike. And that was probably when there were uh, fewer people, fewer firefighters who were vaccinated because based on the number you just gave, it's about eighty percent rate as, as of today. Seventy-seven out of the ninety-six. Is that correct? Correct, but the vaccination's only been around for a period of time, and COVID's yeah. been around for probably about double that time. So right, right, um, right. Yeah. So that yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think it's an evolving situation, and I do want to at least respect their concerns, and we should listen to them. But so, I mean, uh, Rob, in terms of the scope of the HR the HR committee, what were you um, thinking in terms of what? y'all want to look at you and Jim since y'all are both on the HR committee and, and you may not have um, you may not have you know a any idea right now because it's a new um, agenda item or a proposed agenda item for the future but I, I just want us to take into consideration the whole picture I mean I'm not against it I just it just you know I don't it's a, it's a matter of choice at this point too and I get it. It's a health. It's a health and safety issue too. Jim, may I answer? What yeah, you? Rob, and then we'll go to you, Chuck. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's more of a look and see. 
uh, as you know, they say that they're going to change the status from emergency to to regular with the uh, with the vaccine. Uh, and like I said, it, you know, it's something to watch with what the San Mateo County Health Department uh, comes up with uh, relative to their own employees. So I think it's a watch and see at this point. And I have all the confidence of the chief and his staff in order to keep us updated uh, relative to our HR committee. And we can pass whatever concerns we have. And it might be a, what, a meet and confer situation, chief, with the association. Uh, okay. If it does come to a point like that, is that that's it, that's uh, that's correct, Director? Okay. All right. So you, you know, it's more of a wait and see. Thank you, Chuck. Right. You want to okay, answer? but Chuck, do you want this on the September agenda? I'm trying to understand the timing. It sounds like it, but I don't know for sure if we're doing a wait and see, and maybe we'll know more. So, so what what's the timing in your mind? Well, I don't think there's anything magic about the timing. I think we ought to do the inquiry and find out what we need to find out. And it's if it could be considered in September, that would be great, but it, we shouldn't consider it prematurely. So we won't know until we know more. Um, let me mention though, I, your point about talking to employees is, is the first recommendation that I had. And it's separate from the um, Human Resources Committee. That is to engage in, confer with formal meet and confer with our, our two labor unions, but also informal meet and confer with the non-represented uh, people. I, I think we ought to hear what, what the issues are and, and so forth. Um, I, um, but I, I just want to mention uh, the, the comment that there are only three people who have come down with COVID, um, which is, is good. But I'm aware that we've had a number of, of um, quarantines. So it certainly has affected you know, a, a number of people. I don't know how many person days we've lost because of it. I don't know to what extent it's a compromised readiness, but I am aware that there have been you know, a number of, of quarantines uh, that our, our employees have been subjected to. Maybe uh, uh, Chief, you could, uh, you could expand upon that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, we've definitely been very cautious and that's been since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, so in conjunction with HR and with our infection control officer and with the union, uh, we, we had a lot of meetings and it's been evolving based on information that comes out from CDC and County Health. But uh, when people meet certain criteria, we tell them not to come to work other certain criteria are met just to be cautious um you know we've had there's fire departments out there during this during this uh pandemic that have had a lot of people exposed and not necessarily getting covid but just exposed where you can't have them at work so uh we haven't uh had uh, that huge exposure where someone has crossed a, a huge plane and taken out a lot of people but we have had numerous people that have been uh quarantined due to our flow chart and through our designated infection control officer. And um, all we're doing is just trying to keep people safe. And so far it's been, it's been working very well. And of course the firefighters and the, st the staff and everybody working for the district is all doing their due diligence to try and help that by wearing masks and doing what they're supposed to be doing. In, in both counties, I'm aware of this because we have it with all our, our teachers mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, but, um, it was, the, you know, uh, it's now the rule, basically, the first of all, the, the uh, quarantine was reduced from 14 days to 10 days, but any close exposure does require a quarantine for unvaccinated people, 10 days, but not for vaccinated people. And so there's a cost to the district for having someone who's unvaccinated. Maybe I'm, I'm assuming we're paying that person to be on quarantine. I think that's what our practice has been. But that costs our taxpayers, and it's something that's so easily remedied just by getting vaccinated. Um, it, it just doesn't seem reasonable that that it doesn't seem reasonable for um, for our taxpayers to have to incur that, and for our, our readiness to be compromised. 
Um, the, the one other point that, that I wanted to make is, I think it's possible, it's not exactly clear, but I think it's possible, and, um, and Francine, I think, could look into this. I think that we perhaps are required to have the firefighters be vaccinated insofar as they are first responders. And I think the state has mandated that all first responders, and this is recent within the last, say, week or two weeks, um, I think the state has mandated that they all be either uh, vaccinated or have um, maybe twice weekly testing. And I think it's something that uh, we need to look into. You know, uh, so I've... I think the state has required health workers in healthcare facilities to be vaccinated, right? You know, I, I think Francine has some uh, information that'd be useful here. So yeah, Director Corrali is correct. Um, the mandate is for um, healthcare workers for the state of California. So now LA County just recently issued a change to where they're expanding that definition of healthcare to paramedics and EMTs. Um, but uh, the state has not expanded that definition. So right now under the state, the EMT and paramedics do not fall in line with that. No, I, I just wanna say, Chuck, I. I... I applaud the uh, and thank you for the uh, the work that went into your uh, uh, the issue paper that you wrote. It's it's very well done and I think really serves will serve as a as an excellent guideline uh, for the HR committee to to consider the relevant issues uh, on uh, with regard to COVID uh, and testing and vaccination. So. Uh, you know, I know Virginia asked about the scope of uh, the HR committee's work. I, I think it's, I think that scope is reflected in the, the paper you did. So, uh, you know, thank you for, again, it, it reflects a lot of uh, time and attention on your part and thank you. Thank you. So there's a, there's a motion and a second. Uh, is there any more discussion on this uh, item? Michelle, can you please read the motion again? Ed, hold on one moment, please. The motion is to refer this item to the Human Resources Committee for further discussion and to address concerns raised by Director Bernstein's proposal. Right. Director Solano, is that is that what your motion is? That's fine. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All right, Michelle, would you call the vote, please? Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. All right, thank you. And uh, Chief, give our best to Melanie and, and uh, you know, our concern about her mother. Uh, please express our concern. Thanks, Director, I will. All right, uh, that takes us to uh, reports and requests, uh, committee reports. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. All right, Chuck. From the finance committee, everything that we looked at was considered tonight in the meeting and uh, I, there, I have no addition. All right, thank you. Uh, Virginia EPREP. Okay, so we had a great update from um, a few of our volunteer organizations. Um, I just wanted to put out there that this uh, new, well, nonprofit um, has moved into the unincorporated part of North Fair Oaks. This is Casa Circulo Cultural. They were in the incorporated section of North Fair Oaks and now, that, and now they're in the unincorporated areas. And they've reached out to uh, me and I've talked to um, Chief Schaefer and Ryan Zolikoffer and Andres through our well in our at our uh, meeting about possibly getting them more involved. And I've put them in touch with Ever Rodriguez, who um, is the is the head of the North Fair Oaks Community Alliance. And you know they're putting their bat teams or Black Action teams together. So um, we'll continue to work with them and see what happens. Constant Associates, this is for our um, our audit or our study, independent study for the um, OEM. You should have gotten an email from Michelle yesterday that Ryan DeFore with Constant Associates 
is um, going to be conducting interviews with various stakeholders, and he would like to schedule a time to speak with um, the um, director. So if you could just please respond to Michelle's email, that would be terrific. And that's my update. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm writing a reminder to myself uh, to reply to uh, to Michelle with, uh, with the schedule. So uh, thank you. Um, let's see, what's who's up next? Anything from yeah. strategy planning? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Ch Chuck and I met the uh, San Mateo County OES uh, presented their CAD system. Uh, it appears it's still on the drawing board. Uh, the chief and his staff is working with the county uh, to make the system better. Uh, and it's in an infancy uh, stage presently. Uh, second, uh, Chief Navarro uh, is uh, fine tuning the uh, request for proposals for the management audit and inspection. Uh, he's given us a draft uh, that we've looked through. I think what is this, the second draft, Chuck, that he's done for us on this? Second or third, yeah. Yeah, so he's he's working it, and Chuck's doing his magic uh, with his syntax and his grammar skills. <laughs> so, Chuck, you want to add anything to the? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you. And uh, HR committee did not meet uh, this month, so uh, liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports from any of the directors? All right, thank you. Uh, any reports or requests uh, of directors? Wait, can I have a quick liaison report, Jim? Sure, Sorry. Virginia, sure. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, thank the town of Atherton for their national night out event, which I attended on August 3rd. It was really great and very well attended. And um, kudos to our drone team and the firefighters who were there all of the residents who were there, the people who attended um, thought our guys were great. And it was great to see them there and also, you know, to support um, the police department. Great, yeah, thank you for that. Um, reports, requests of directors. Chuck? I have just one thing um, and it actually comes from a constituent, but, uh, uh, some people are involved in, in trying to prepare the community to a greater extent for, um, for uh, disasters and so forth. And apparently for the first time, the district is submitting what's called a local hazard mitigation plan. Um, it's uh, drafts are being circulated now. And I believe the, the final, uh, the final draft is due on August 24th. I don't know this for a fact, but so I'm saying this second, second hand, but I'm told that, that the report that, that the fire district is submitting indicates that the board has reviewed the plan and approved of it. And um, I, I have never seen it. I don't know anything about it. And, um, so my request is, is a simple one. I, I'd simply like to get a request. I'd like to get a copy of the draft. I assume it's still in draft form, but if it's final, a final form, either way, I'd like to get a copy of it and to see if in fact we, we it was cited that we had approved of it. And um, I just want to look, see firsthand for myself. So I'm requesting chief, if uh, you could have a copy of the uh, local hazard mitigation plan that's being submitted to the county. Uh, if I could receive a copy of that, please. Absolutely, Director. I just spoke to Ryan Zolikoffer, um, I believe it was last week, and I believe his plan was to circulate it to all the board members uh, so you can all see it and in its draft form. And I don't think he plans on submitting it until everybody's seen it. Very good, thank you. Uh, any other reports or requests? All right. 
Uh, President's report, um, you know, our uh, efforts continue, you know, relative to uh, uh, recruitment and selection of a, uh, of a new chief. Uh, I want to recognize uh, uh, Chief Schaefer for, you know, his, you know, really outstanding work as the interim. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with, uh, uh, with you, Chief, and uh, uh, I want to thank you again for stepping up and, uh, and filling that role and uh, look forward to working with you uh, for whatever the duration is. So, Thank you very much, Director. All right. Well, uh, that brings us to the last uh, public comment. Michelle, is there uh, anyone uh, that would like to speak? Anybody has any public comments? Please raise your hand or press star nine on your telephone. And I do not see any. All right, very good. Uh, is there a, a motion to adjourn? Well, so to out, McLaughlin. Be, yes, thank you. This would be returning to the uh, uh, the closed the special board uh, meeting. Right. Wait, so, but so are we, we will adjourning? be adjourning if please are we yeah. adjourning so this my, regular my, meeting? Let, let, let's hear from Stephen. My suggestion would be uh, that the board could vote to adjourn this regular meeting. And that would be the end of this regular meeting. My only suggestion would be that before you do that, maybe Michelle could make sure that the board members know where they should go in the Zoomosphere in order to continue the special meeting that is still as yet uh, unfinished. So the special board meeting closed session Zoom link is still available. So you'll get on using, go back to that link and open that up. Good. Um, there may be some difficulties with me getting in. And if so, Stephen Miller will jump in and help me out. <laughs> All right, I, I would propose that we, we take uh, 15 minutes, which would take us to, let's say 8.55. Great. Yeah, so, so, I'll, so Steve Miller, I can um, make a motion to adjourn the regular meeting, correct? correct? So I move to adjourn the regular meeting tonight. Second. All right, very good. Uh, Michelle, uh, yeah. you... oh, can I just one quick comment? Please, please, Trent. I'm still at my office. I'm going to run out of here and go home. It should take me 10 minutes to go home. But if I'm a minute late for the, the meeting, just know that I'm on my way. Let's say nine o'clock. Well, you don't need to make it later. Yeah, we'll give you a few more minutes. I think everybody would welcome the. Uh, <laughs> okay, nine o'clock. Okay, Thank we'll you. Say nine o'clock then. All right. So there's uh, a motion and a second to adjourn this meeting. Right, Michelle, would you please uh, call the vote? Director Bernstein. <coughs> I'm sorry, I heard oh, a call. Aye. Thank aye. you, Director Jones. Aye. Uh, Director Crawley. Aye. Director Solano. Aye. Director McLaughlin. Aye. All right, I'll see all of you at the uh, the uh, return to the closed meeting at nine o'clock. You all have the link. It'll be the same Thank you. link as we used before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.